Jesus, we pray free as free indeed. In all joy unspeakable and full of glory, full of glory, full of glory. In his joy unspeakable and full of glory, all the half has never yet been told. I have found the pleasure I once craved, it was joy and peace within.
many, many decades ago. And that text was this, from 3 John, verse 4. He was preaching to a congregation of lots of Kardaskis. There may be a few of you here this evening. That text says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Karl Kardatsky was a beloved son of this congregation. He was a beloved professor that many of us enjoyed working with as students when we were at Anderson College. Dr. Karl preached from that text to this congregation about 63 years ago, and it touched my heart as a young pastor when he used that text. A young man, 60-some years ago, who was a member of this congregation named Lyle Brinkman, when I was pastor, was a joy to me, and he and his wife, Gwendolyn Bubsey, as most of you know her, gave to my son, Michael, who is here with his son, my grandson, Christopher, gave him his first dog, a collie which Mike named Lassie. And these folks have been dear to my heart all these years since. But the key thing that I want to share with you is that about 10 years ago, at the church I attend when I'm in my, at my home in Florida, I met a man named Dwayne Hale, a delightful man who grew up, I believe, in Genoa, 
right next door. Man who loves to sing, play his guitar, and express his love for God at every opportunity. And Dwayne Hale told me one day when he learned that I'd been pastor of this church many years ago when I was younger and skinnier than I am now. He told me that Lyle Brinkman had led him to the Lord. They were working together hauling grain. Staying one night when they were out on the road in the same hotel room. Lyle Brinkman knelt in prayer. Dwayne Hale, uh, De, yeah, Dwayne Hale was not saved at that time. And he began to ask Lyle questions about his Christian life. He was impressed with what Lyle both said and did as a Christian man. Dwayne gave his life to Christ. And these many years later, I know him as a leader in a congregation of a thousand people, a man that goes many places with his wife singing the gospel. And if Lyle is here tonight, thank you, Lyle, for helping my friend Dwayne Hale come to know Christ. Also worshiping at Bayside Community Church of God in Florida, where I attend and am active, uh, is a young lady, well, I'll be truthful, she was young when she lived here and came to this church. Not that she's old now, but she's older. And that young lady is Diane Moxig de Bolt. One day down in Florida, Diane told me that sitting in a pew in church here one Sunday, she leaned over to her mother and said, Mother, I want to be a Christian. I want now to give my life to Christ. She did, and Diane is a leader with her husband, Jerry, in that congregation, Bayside Community Church of God in Safety Harbor, Florida, where I attend church regularly and find joy in knowing these people there who have their roots of Christian faith and life in Elmore Church of God. That's a joy. And I share some of these stories with you because I want you to feel the joy that I feel as having been pastor in those years, pastor to these people I mentioned long ago, but the fruit of the Christian life is still being born out. The son of this congregation Elmer Karnatsky and his wife Vera were also a great blessing to me. Vera was my Sunday school teacher when I was a little kid out in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And when my wife Lucina, that some of you will remember, was terminally ill with cancer, Elmer and Vera were on one of their winter excursions to Florida and they brought to our home food so much to help and bless us in such great amount that I had to share it with the neighbors. It was more than Lucina and I could eat. Another meaningful story out of, of my life, our life in Elmore. Lucina and I were very young when we came here as pastor. I was 20, all of 23 years old. Too young to know what I was doing, really. But 
I tried to learn and you were patient with me and you helped me along. But in those young years of our married life, Lucina was told by more than one doctor that she would have to have surgery before she could carry a child to birth. We didn't want to have to do that. So one day over in this house that was then the parsonage, we knelt and prayed and asked God to give us a child without having to undergo that surgery. Then we did the action that was necessary to prove our faith. And almost nine months to the day after that prayer, Michael, our firstborn son, who is here with us tonight, was born October 1st, 1949. Michael is an answer to our prayers and the support and help that this congregation gave us. Now for some light, light-hearted story, and I'm sorry, but I'm going to take privilege to go longer than you encouraged us to do. <laughs> I was pastor here about two-thirds of the way back in the history of this church. I came here 65 years ago. You're only 100 years old. I know you 65 years ago. I was called to be the pastor at that young age when this church building was under construction. I didn't plan it with committees. I didn't. I came in the middle of the construction. Unusual, especially to bring a 23-year-old boy. <laughs> a boy I was. I thought I wasn't, but I was in the middle of a construction project that I knew absolutely nothing about. I didn't even know how to build a doghouse, much less a church. I've been involved in other building programs since, but this was the first and I was set down in the middle of it. And if it hadn't been for the likes of the Addis and the Kardatsky brothers and Fred Webert and Carlton Yagel and Roland Gleckler and lots of others whose names don't come to mind and I apologize for that. But those were the people that helped me as a young pastor get this finished. And I helped choose this pulpit, short enough for the likes of me, not high enough for the likes of your present pastor Tom. <laughs> it fit me fine. But I believe it was the next Sunday after we had the dedication service here that we had a baptismal service. And lo and behold, we didn't have a Baptist. Church of God congregation that teaches baptism by immersion without a baptistry. Now you have one. Thanks be to God. Then we didn't have one. So the next Sunday after dedicating this building that we loved so well, I arranged to borrow the Christian church to have a Sunday evening service there with the baptism. A little chagrined, a little embarrassed, but we forged forward and now you have a baptistry in this Church of God congregation building. That's great. As the first Easter in this building approached, I thought we should have some candles on the communion table. 
Erlanger Church, uh, Erlanger. I was years later pastor of Erlanger Church of God in northern Kentucky. But Elmore Church of God had never had candles in the church before. I thought Easter Sunday, 1940, whatever year it would have been, 49 or 50, 50 probably, I thought we should have candles on the communion table. So I was in a downstairs Sunday school room. I'd strung some candle holders from some place and got some candles, and I was fixing them to bring them up and put them on this table. Behind me, I heard the shuffling of feet. I turned around, and there was Mother Kardatsky. I greeted her. <coughs> Candles. I guess we're becoming Roman Catholic. <laughs> there I was, maybe 24 years old by then, with the sainted mother of this congregation saying that to me. Oh Lord, what can I say to her? The Lord help me. I said, no, Mother Kardetsky, we're not becoming Roman Catholic. These candles are a symbol of Christ, the light of the world. Oh, then that's all right. <laughs> and I got by with a new thing in the church. One Sunday morning, I casually mentioned that I was supposed to attend the state minister's committee meeting over in Akron that afternoon, but I told the congregation that I wouldn't be going because I wouldn't have time to drive back in time to preach in the evening service. After the service in the morning was over, Paul Gottke came to me and he said, Pastor, he said, if you want me to, I'll fly you to Akron and get you back in time to preach tonight. So Paul and I had a flight across the wonderful farmland of northern Ohio and I got to my meeting in Akron and got back in time to preach here in this building that night. That was a wonderful Sunday, an exciting Sunday, all thanks to Paul Gottke. This next story will be by way of a little confession. When we moved into the parsonage back here in 1948, the only source of heat for that pretty big house were, were two coal-burning space heaters. One in the living room and one in that other front room, which was a bedroom. That was it. And to compound the problem, I had no experience nor ability with building coal fires. For the life of me, I could not keep coal fire in those stones going. When our son Michael was to be born October 1st, 1949, fall of the year, and you know better than I that uh, by that time of the year, cold weather is impending, and I became worried about how to keep the new baby warm. So I talked to my friend, then member of this congregation, I believe his first name was John Van Dyke. And I told him my problem. John thought about it a few minutes and he said, I'll solve the problem for you, Pastor. So a few days later he came with two oil burning space heaters. And he installed them. I didn't have to worry about being too ignorant about building coal fires. 
And then I said, but how are we going to get the heat upstairs? John said, I'll solve that too. So he brought his tools and cut two registers, one in the living room, one in that front bedroom, through the ceiling, through the floor upstairs, and put registers in those. And the parsonage was warm far better than before, and the baby stayed warm. He survived now 64 years, and uh, everything was great for the Lees over in the parsonage. But John said, when the project was completed, John said, don't tell the Board of Trustees what we've done. <laughs> I didn't. And I wonder if those registers are still over in that house. One evening after being out making calls on church folks, I pulled into the parsonage driveway back here and found that my car had no brakes. I coasted very slowly into the garage without hitting the back wall. I went in the house and told Lucina that I had no brakes on the car and I had no money to have them repaired. We prayed together about the problem that evening. The next morning I went up to the car, had brakes, and had brakes on that car without any repairs as long as I owned it. God is great. Now just two more stories, and these are Kardatsky stories. The rest of you can listen in if you want to. But, who all here has a Kardatsky connection? Okay, you're still here. I really don't know which one of these to tell first, but I think I'll tell the Arlen story first. When Michael here was just a few weeks old, his mother arranged with Arlen Kardatsky to come over and take eight millimeter movies, which he loved to do, of Michael in all the many different outfits of clothing with which he had been shown. His mother put on every stitch of clothing that was in that house for this little guy when he was a tiny baby. And Arlen was filming away and an hour passed, and this was going on, and Michael, by this time, was tired and crying, hungry, sleepy. Finally, the ordeal stopped. Michael was put to bed. Arlen opened his camera. Oh, my! I forgot to put the film in the camera. And now one about Harris for that. Everybody remember Harris? The oldest brother. Harris was treasurer, treasurer of this church at that time. One night in a board meeting, Harris turned to me and he said, the water bill over at the parsonage is getting awfully high too high. You all must be the kind that flush the toilet every time you go. <laughs> what young creatures go through. My response to Harris was, yes, Harris, we do. <laughs> The conversation stopped right there. None of the other board members picked up with Harris at all. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. <laughs> My time as El in Elmore was not a long period, but it was a wonderful period for me. 
help me get a start in the ministry that has gone on now until I'm less than 12 years away from being 100 years old. It was short, but during that time we dedicated this place of worship and study and fellowship. We had people saved and baptized and married and buried. And I have lots of wonderful memories, lots of things to give thanks to God for, for you and this first pastorate that I had. Thanks for letting me share all this with your sense. Would be here where the red-haired lady is. 
um, and on so on. And we would hear some, some stirring testimonies. I'll just touch on a couple of these. Um, one was um, about Fred Webber's conversion. Fred Webber is an uncle of mine and an uncle to some of you here. Um, he was converted in an artillery bombardment during World War I. He was a very young man, and he was caught in this bombardment, was hiding under a wagon, had no proper shelter from the bombardment. And uh, he knew about the Lord, but he knew he was far from the Lord, and he prayed, Lord, save me. If you will save my life, I will give my life to you. Well, God spared his life, and, and Fred Weber was good to his word. When he managed to get back to the States and get back into this congregation, he was in this in this building anytime the doors were open. Led the Sydney many times, helped with all sorts of things. And in fact, I think he became an Olympic stay-at-home. I don't know if he left Ohio for any reason after that, after that experience. Uh, another testimony was um, Harry Klinger, who used to sit right about where Mardell is. Raise your hand, Mardell. And by the way, Pastor uh, Lyle Brinkman is here. He's about seven rows behind me. Um, Harry Klinger was saved after someone threw a copy of the Gospel Trumpet magazine out the speeding train past his house. He was working in his garden, and somebody threw the Gospel Trumpet out, and it made complete sense to him. He wrote to Anderson, found out there was a congregation nearby, came into this congregation, uh, was saved, and was an active member of the congregation. Uh, he lived to be 100 years old. He died in, in 1976. Merle, what? 102. Did he? I thought he died in 1976. Okay, thank you for that update. Uh, he, he, he lived the entire second century of the United States that Merle tells me, topped it off with another two years, um, and sat over there and then we admired him for that. Uh, one other testimony, and I'll stop with those. But to give you the principle of this repeating of Christian stories was Art Gleckler, who sat clear on that side, the right-hand side as you face the front. And that was partly because Art had lost his right ear in a farm accident. And there was no prosthetic on there. There was just a hole in his head where his, where his sound would be registered. Well, we kids would be looking to see this hole in Art Gleckler's head, so he sat over there to make it difficult and probably to overcome some of his self-consciousness. But his testimony was one that we actually probably heard indirectly because he, like some of the other people who came, really didn't speak up very much. But he had been nearly killed when the horses ran away with a cultivator and fell under it. And as I understand the story, my grandfather, Fred Kordansky, rescued him from that, stopped the horses, and they got him to medical care. He recovered, and that was the dramatic incident that led him to the Lord. So uh, that the principle of telling those testimonies, I think we're reliving here tonight, hearing uh, testimonies and stories about life in this church. And uh, this isn't the same as writing scripture was back in the times when they were capturing the life of Jesus, but it's a little parallel to that. We're capturing how the Spirit of God has moved through people in their own lives, in this congregation, in various uh, ways. And uh, so I really value that, that memory. It could go on at great length, and Spencer is almost menacing me with his glance. <laughs> so thank you for the time, and, the, and the welcome back to the Church of God of Elmer. Elmer. At this time, we'd like to invite the Kardetsky family singers to come up. Um, they will be singing There is Joy in the Lord, and then um, when we all get to heaven, and they would like you to join in with them when we sing when we all get to heaven. And you can come up onto the stage here, too.
us for when we are, all get to heaven. It's on page 729, and it's also on the screen. And you might as well stand for this one. This is a good one. Our, and our family. 
and at a time when you were looking for a pastor, uh, he and Dad had a conversation that eventually led us here. What a, it was a bit of a culture shock from Denver to here, um, mountains to very fruitful plains, <laughs> um, city to country, and it took just a little bit to get adjusted. I remember one of our first entrances, um, things happened a little differently in different parts of the country, and one of the first weddings when our family was here, uh, in Colorado, if the weddings are 2.30, that's when the wedding gets started. Well, we arrived around 2.30, 2.35, and the bride was walking down the aisle. Here, it, that's when the bride was walking down the aisle. So whoever's wedding that was, we apologize. But uh, we, we had uh, false information in our, in our experience. But it was funny. Little things like that would happen. Um, Bubsy was the one that taught me how to make a pie. I never knew that till I came here. <laughs> Dad loved pastoring this church and serving its people. He had a servant's heart. He was the real thing. And as you mentioned, the Wednesday night, Sunday night services, I spent many um, minutes on my knees in these pews and at the altar that used to be up in front. And I had a really tender heart, so I spent a lot of time at that altar <laughs> because I just felt so close to God and, and uh, I had a real tender heart. Those were special times, and I, appreciate, um, I appreciated hearing about the conversion of uh, Fred Weber. When I still, when I go down um, 105, I, I still think that's Fred Weber's land, you know. Um, but I appreciated hearing about those. Mom and Dad, Paul and Louise, were a ministry team. What one lacked, the other one had. They were both very dedicated to God, loved scripture, loved teaching, hearing teaching, and being teachers. Dad was very knowledgeable about scripture. Mom was very insightful. Um, and I remember when... A, an emergency would happen, like a death in the church or something like that. Um, Mom would be the one that would be strong right at the beginning, helping to get the status quo and walking through those initial steps of that. And then she'd be exhausted afterwards. Dad would be a little um, frustrated, not frustrated, but hurt and concerned during, and then he was ready to go. So between the two of them, they covered every funeral <laughs> with, with great coverage because they, their personalities matched and they just filled in the gaps that the other one had. My favorite, they were very human people, uh, real people, down to earth people. And my, we had a great sense of humor in my family and my mom would notice things if something happened wrong in the pulpit. And my dad's, my favorite mishap, and I'm not sure if it happened here or if it happened in our bed of Colorado, but this kind of thing happened every once in a while. Uh, my dad was preaching about Moses and the burning bush, and he said, Moses, take off your feet. You are on holy ground. <laughs> and our pew was just shaking. My mom was shaking, quiet, you know, was laughing quietly, and, and we were laughing, and he would do that, and I have inherited that disease. My mouth does not always say what my head is thinking. The piano, Sharon, I've heard you at that piano many times, and it was a friend of mine when I was here. I was taking piano lessons from Mrs. Was it Tank? Tank. Lucille Tank. Lucille Tank. And many of you maybe did that as well, and maybe have the knuckles to show for it, you know. What? You know. But I spent hours at that piano. I only wish it would have accomplished something so that I could play better today. But, but it was a great joy to do that. I remember uh, Dad putting long hours into his sermons. He would type them up on his royal, black royal typewriter. And, and he really liked studying, and uh, he, I have all the sermons he ever preached. He kept those in a drawer. And so one of the things I did was kind of put them in a book, and I am looking forward to someday when I have the nerve going back and reading through some of those, because I remember living through some of those uh, sermons. And I remember many vacations. 
that were delayed because there was a need at the church. Something had happened to someone in the church and they needed a pastor. And our vacation was late because he felt so called to be a servant to the people around here. Even after we left, people called him for funerals or marriages or filling in, you know, for other pastors. He loved, like when they were on vacation, he loved coming back here. And clear to his, the time of his death, wouldn't you like to go back to a Sunday service at Elmore, you know? And at that time, he had to mention I was concerned it would really disorient him. But you were never out of his mind. Or my mom. She came every Friday to Elmore to get her hair cut. <laughs> She lived to 87. <laughs> That's a lot of years. And my father lived to 91. So you have been uh, in our mind ever since we've been here. Dad also, um, Dad also had a passion for bus ministry. And many didn't know where that came from, but that's how his family was brought into the grace, saving grace of God. Um, people from the church in Independence, Kansas, would bring their family to church. First one of the brothers, and then another one of the brothers, and uh, the whole family ended up being converted and are solid Christians today because of the outreach of the local church and a few caring people in that church. So his heart was very much in that. That was one of his passions. The Kurdatskis know their history here, and most, that's many of you. You don't know the, the nice history, and I didn't really learn about it until recently, but I think you'll find it interesting. Um, my dad's, they were from Kansas and Oklahoma, and Kansas and Oklahoma didn't become states until a lot later than we did, or er, than Ohio. And uh, my father's dad was more of a traveler and um, had trouble lighting in one place. And they were not rich. My dad's uh, family traveled from co covered wagon from Oklahoma to Independence, Kansas, when my grandmother finally put her foot down and said, these kids need education. Um, so those stories you hear from out west about people travel traveling by covered wagon, dad did that. And he used to talk about, you know, riding sometimes. They walked a lot more. Some of those old western stories uh, were a reality in their family. And I remember one of the more threatening areas, all the kids, the oldest brother would have a chain and he'd swing it over his head and all the younger, like family of nine or 10, um, would, would walk under that chain to make it safely to school because those were some of the uh, oil days and there were some rough areas. So, that's in a whole other book, but I just thought, since the Kardaskis are sharing so much of their heritage, I thought that was a real interesting thing about my father. But he grew up simply, and it made him a really hard worker. His dad passed away when he was a teenager, so the hard work he put in here, and I, I can't thank him enough because not only he had to do some extra work at some point because I was going to college and dental work and all that, but he was such a hard worker. I have so much to be grateful for as well as just being a strong light in our family. Uh, hopefully you remember my mom's deep laughter. Oh, I love hearing that coming from, she had a loud, boisterous laugh, and I love it. Now I have a loud, boisterous laugh. I wonder where I got that from. Um, a lot of laughter was experienced here in Elmore. We were very close to many of many of the families here, but Brinkman's and Adi's were especially close because Joan and I were in school together with Judy, Adi, and then Naoma got into the mix, and we have traveled a lot. Uh, Jeannie was here at that time, and so they'd go up to the lake, Houghton Lake, and, and, and since they couldn't travel all over, and we would share a week up there. I have so much, mem so many memories of laughter, late game nights. Oh, we had a lot of those. <laughs> it was, it was a lot of fun. One of the biggest life lessons I learned was from Gerald Goldsby, and it rings in my head. Awesome. In the last few years, when I was going through some challenging times, and um, it was when we were going out west for a youth convention in Colorado, and we were stopping at your relative's farm out in Kansas. 
Now, I had ridden horses on trails in the mountains when I was little. Everybody follows along, nice and gently. Well, I got up on the horse, and he swatted the end of the horse, and I said, oh. <laughs> He said, keep your head straight up in the saddle. And I, that's what I did. I prayed, and I kept my head straight up in the saddle, and eventually got it turned around and come home, too. But, boy, that is something that, that has been a life lesson to me. No matter what's going on around you, keep your eyes straight up, keep your head straight up, and get through it. So thank you for that. That has served me well through the years. Uh, I think that's about it. For those of you that love my parents, both of them died peacefully. Um, and God was so close. And it was like uh, in the years I was caregiving for them, you know, in the last 10 years, it was like God would put breadcrumbs on the path and I just had to follow them. We had, uh, we were active in, uh, after here we went to Portage, Ohio, and we're active in the, Sto in the East Polk Avenue Church of God, then Stonebridge, and wonderful support group from our Sunday school class there. And um, my mom went through 10 years of dialysis, but did great, was the healthiest one up there. And uh, dad, you, when you look at him, he would have been just the same, but he had a little bit of memory uh, dementia, but a gentle dementia. And uh, so they loved you. Thank you for loving them. And every time you, I know people from here even came to their funerals. So I still feel like your family and look forward to years in the future. And thank you for the memories that we have today. Now we will show our video of the weddings and anniversaries in the Omar Fisher Cat history.
the smoke of my transgression, greater far than all my sin and shame. Oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus, praise His name. Are there any others who might have some stories or memories that they would like to come up and share with us today? Feel free to come on up for right We'll have another short little time before we continue on the rest of the song. I don't remember anything <laughs> about this church. I was born here, and we moved away when I was about one and a half. But I just wanted to thank you all for being such a blessing to my dad and my mother. songs together with the rhythm that they have. I was thinking this congregation is a hundred years old and that goes back to the days when people were still riding horses and a lot of these Church of God songs that we've been singing tonight were very likely written while the writers were riding horseback. And some of us think that, that that may account for some of the bouncing rhythm of those songs, like his yoke is easy, his burden is light. They were written on horseback, jumping, bouncing up and down. stories. Uh, that baptism over the Christian church, I was there and so was Brother Connors. We were, were prepared for baptism and did it over there. I was uh, about 12 years old. And uh, I had survived. Uh, sometimes we get saved, you know, like at eight years old. But then when there's a tornado and you're 12 years old, you get saved all over again. <laughs> I, I noticed that as we were singing together, and when we all get to heaven, and that is the greatest gift of all. <clears throat> when we all get to heaven, and we were singing that with a rhythm that's not in that book, because they haven't published it with that repeat. When we all, when we all get to heaven. Well, it's not in the book. It was in the previous one about 24 years ago when that was used. So you have a long musical memory to be able to sing together with us as we did. And that is a joy that we hope to share Forever. Amen. All right, 
let's go into our last couple of hymns that we have. Let me see Jesus only, and heaven came down and glory filled my soul. And you do sing better standing, so I'm going to ask you to stand. Heaven came down and glory filled my 
Tanya is not here tonight, but um, you know, something like this just doesn't happen overnight. Uh, I know Spencer's been planning for about two years now, uh, this, this weekend, and uh, from the church, we just want to say thank you for all of your hard work that you've put in. You can clap. And uh, the Elmore Church congregation appreciate all your hard work, and uh, I am thankful to each and every one of you so very much. So, thank you from the bottom of not only my heart but this congregation's heart. Thank you so much. And now I'd like to, uh, yeah, you can stand. You can stand. that I'll share real quick. Um, this, this was my first pastor. It, it still is my first pastor here in Elmore. And um, I've told this story to the congregation several times. But I used to come up here and still do at times on, on, Saturday, or on, on Sunday or Saturday evenings uh, to kind of go over my sermon and pray and do a few other things, and I remember when I was here for about six or seven months, and I'd come up here to, to uh, just practice my sermon and, and, and pray, uh, all of a sudden I would be greeted by a host of bats in the sanctuary. Yeah, it was just crazy. Uh, and so what I would do is I would bring my tennis racket along, and I would begin to swat at the bats. 
Uh, and, and one thing I learned about bats is when you get them on the ground, uh, you can basically pick them up and, and do whatever you want to even kill them because once they're on the ground, they can't get up and fly. Uh, the reason they hang down from like a ceiling or something is because they need to drop and have that air underneath their wings and, and swoop down. So I, I learned some things about bats. We've gotten rid of that problem, thank the Lord. Uh, but that was just uh, one thing that I, I experienced here when I uh, when I first got here. So, uh, Ken Fairbanks, if, if you would come, please. And uh, Ken was the pastor here from 1989 to 2001, and uh, he's going to close us uh, in a in a word of prayer. First, but first the word. The bats were here way before you got here. <laughs> when we first tried an air, I, uh, I got trapped behind my desk one night in that room with a bat. It scared me to death. So I started throwing parts of my library at it. That's before I climbed under my desk and called my wife to come rescue me. <laughs> and the rest of that story was we thought we had rid of them then, didn't we? Board. We closed it all off. We counted heads as they came out, and we had something like 125 bats came out of the, the attic of this place. It was a reoccurring thing. So, how long ago did you say you got rid of them? Oh, well, then you must have made it. So, uh, I moved to be here. Um, we were here, I think, what was that, 12 years? Do my math real quick. Um, Raised my family here. My daughter started school over in Woodville and finished up at the high school my wife taught here. My kids graduated here. They grew up in this church. They were part of this congregation and they were part of your lives just like we were. And I was so blessed today to be able to hug and meet people I hadn't seen for a long, long time. And to think about people that uh, that aren't here anymore. And the, the Karnatskis are definitely a wonderful big part of this congregation. But there were a lot of individual lives that were here when we ministered. And, you know, there's several that jump up. Names like uh, Fern Biddle, Bob Phillips, even Don Adi, which is a name everyone knows. but. There was many, many names, many, many lives this church touched while we were here. And I believe God is still touching here today. And I'm moved also by you know, seeing Spencer, but brothers and sisters and children and some that aren't here today. My kids couldn't be here today. Uh, they wanted to be. This church ministered to them. It touched many, many lives. Many, many lives not represented even by those sitting here in these, uh, these uh, seats today. So this is a wonderful place. This was a place as I reflected back. I'm a chaplain now, so we reflect. Um, and as we reflected back, what we were, shorter leash now, um, reflected back, the one thing that I saw in this congregation where we're here is we were in a constant state of looking for what God is already doing and then tried to get behind that. And as a result of that, there were a lot of things that happened. And I believe that there are still a lot of things happening for that same reason. Because you're faithful to see what God is and look what God is doing and go there. And so God is blessing. God is blessing many of you out from all these places that you've come from today to be here tonight. And I think there's some smiling going on in heaven. There's some smiling in my heart as we sing these songs. And there's definitely joy in my heart for the Lord. Let's just bow our head for me. Father in heaven, we are so grateful for your presence here. And as we've shared a lot about what's happened in the lives of people, as we've shared the stories, of the events, the history, 
the one thing, God, that uh, is good and fitting that we should remember as we close our time together is to remember, God, that you were here in all of it. That, God, your presence is what makes us strong. It is your presence that brings us salvation. It is your presence, God, that has drawn us even here together tonight. It's your presence, God, that makes this place holy. And so we come before you right now and we give you thanks. So blessed to see the hands that you partner with do your work here in this kingdom. And God, to see all of the things that are taking place in people's lives and have taken place in people's lives as we share and, and about the, the events and the things of our past and God our present. Be with us now as we go our separate ways. We give you thanks. We pray that the memories will continue to surface, that we will continue to be blessed as we see what you have done and recognize the path that you've put us on and where you've brought us. We ask your blessing now in all these things, and we give you thanks and praise for your work here at Elmore. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I guess I might as well tell a little bit of the story. Um, people have asked me how long I've been planning this, and I tell them, really, two years I've actually been doing the physical work of it, but 10 years ago, when we were about to do our 90th celebration, I asked Pastor Tom, what can we do for our 90th celebration? I want to have a big thing. And he said, let's wait for the 100th. So really, 10 years in the making in my head, and two years in the making in actual physical physicality. But um, just so we can capture who all attended tonight and tomorrow morning, just like we did at the picnic, if you could. Um, the guest books are at each door, so if you could make sure you sign those so we have those for future generations just to see who is here during this time. Thank you, and I hope to see you tomorrow morning. <laughs>